What's up, gamer girls? Yeah. Mm -mm. So, the original idea for this video was to go through the new Viz Manga app and put together a list of cool and good series to help you get the most out of the already insane value of their two-buck-a-month subscription. You know, read a couple chapters of their current simulpubs to see what's good there, mix in some classics from the likes of Rumiko Takahashi and Junji Ito to seem cultured, maybe shout out some good shit from the Jump app like Akane Banashi and Showa Shoten while we're here and call it a day. Good plan, easy content, except I made one fatal mistake. The first current simulpub I checked out was Freerun Beyond Journey's End, and then all of a sudden I didn't have any time left to check out any other manga or especially write about them before we head to Anime North this weekend. But on the bright side, I am now like 40 chapters deep into one of the best fantasy stories I've ever read, and properly pre-hyped for the best anime of this coming fall. So I'm all too happy to put that easy listicle aside for at least a couple weeks and tell you all about why A, this manga slaps, and B, the anime is posed to slap even harder. So we all know the typical Japanese fantasy template at this point, right? There's a demon king off somewhere getting up to demon king stuff. Prophecies speak of a hero destined to take a magic sword and beat his ass. A protagonist-y looking fellow gathers a balanced party of allies to do just that, and then they go do that. Freerun, as its subtitle suggests, picks up at the end of that journey, as the handsome hero Himmel, carousing priest Heiter, stout dwarven warrior Ison, and aloof elven mage Freerun roll back into the royal capital for a rousing round of statue raising, parades, and all the other good stuff they give you for beating the Demon King's ass. And just in time to enjoy a gorgeous semi-centennial meteor shower, too. Though, as the elf notes from personal experience, the effect is diminished somewhat by all the light pollution in the city. She knows of an even more breathtaking spot to watch the Celestial Show, though, and as the party parts ways, they promise to meet up for it in 50 years' time, with Freerun saying she may pop in to say hi from time to time in the century or so she's planning to spend exploring the central provinces, seeking out esoteric new magics to add to her collection. Years pass a little differently when you've lived to see a thousand of them, see? While the decade they spent on the road may have been the defining moment in her companions' lives, and certainly conquering the Demon King was the culmination of quite a lot for Freerun too, on her geologic scale it was hardly any time at all. Or so she tells herself, anyway, until the day Himmel dies, and overcome with emotions she didn't know were there, she realizes how much that time and those people really meant to her. Thus, the millennium-old magic collector finds herself with a new quest that fits quite nicely with her old hobby, studying the humans she meets while picking up strange spells. Starting, eventually, after another couple decades, with the old drunk Heiter in the few years he has left. And, as a bonus, his adopted daughter Fern, who's shaping up to be quite the spellcaster in her own right, but needs the tutelage of a real magic master to level up her skills. Eventually, when the devout old drunkard's finally gone, the girl falls into Freerun's care as her apprentice, though considering the elf's precocious mannerisms and propensity for sleeping till noon, it's fairer to say that they care for each other, and together they set back out on her endless quest to discover new magic, roughly retracing the steps of her old hero's journey along the way stopping in each place for however long they're needed, be it weeks, months, or even years. Despite her newfound appreciation for the finite scale of a human life, the elf is still getting a grasp on what a reasonable amount of time is for a detour. As their journey wears on, flashbacks gradually fill in details of the story before this story, which proves to be quite entertaining in its own right, and naturally, in step with that, we learn more and more about the world both stories are set in, its deep history and the history of magic that intertwines with it. 
Free Rin is a truly beautiful manga, and I'm not just talking about the gorgeously delicate illustrations or the subtle shading of its occasional watercolor pages when I say that. Charming and poignant in equal measure, filled with hilariously human moments punctuated by beats of profound sadness, its story feels like the perfect blend of To Your Eternity and Spice and Wolf. It's Odd to call a comic that can breeze over multiple years in the space of a single chapter languid in its pacing, but the way that detailed, characterful art invites you to linger in the silent moments between big events, even as they rush by, really makes you feel like you're experiencing time through the eyes of an immortal. Of course, it's not all wandering in the woods and pontificating on past glories. That'd probably get boring pretty quick, even with the quality of character writing and world building on display here. Beyond Journey's End is a proper adventure in its own right, with monsters to fight, mysteries to solve, and eventually an epic quest with its own concrete goal at the end. One a little more personal than saving the whole world, but no less fantastical or important, at least from our heroine's perspective. She also picks up an adventuring party of her own along the way, packed with personalities every bit as vibrant as those that once traveled with her and the pretty boy Himmel. First, naturally, is Fern, who grows into a hilariously blunt and sharp-witted young woman in her travels with Freyrun. Then there's Stark, Aizen's cowardly yet competent warrior apprentice, whose innocent, some might say childish and naive outlook, often leads him to butt heads with that younger mage. There's also some others who I'll let you discover for yourself as the journey goes on. Also, of course, it wouldn't be much of a quest without villains to oppose those heroes beyond the occasional monster of the week. The Demon King may be long dead, but remnants of his army still linger in the lands up north, and many folks have forgotten how to deal with the threat they pose in the last near century of peace, so there's plenty of work for the world's most powerful mage and her companions to take care of through their travels. I won't go spoil what happens with the first demons we encounter, as I'm sure that's going to make for an incredibly tense and exciting climax when the anime drops this fall, but in as vague terms as possible, I do want to impress upon you just how wonderfully, inhumanly wicked the manga's portrayal of the demons is. I don't want to say evil, because such a black and white term doesn't really do the nuance of how they're written justice, but Man, they're fucking evil. They possess intellect, eloquence, and a capacity for reason, yet their way of thinking is eerily and convincingly alien. These demons are well and truly beasts, every bit as ravenous and quite a bit more malevolent than your average dragon, using words and logic the way other monsters use their fangs and claws to ensnare and devour their prey. Which means the story can use them as compelling conversation partners, have them speak to its deeper themes, and even tug at the occasional heartstring without ever undermining the idea that these things pose a profound existential threat to the world that must be stopped at all costs. They're some of the creepiest and most memorable monsters in any manga I've read, and as they're all magic users, they conveniently make for quite interesting opponents for our heroes to face as well both in terms of strategies employed and the lore explored through those fights. As fantasy stories go, Freerun is absolutely firing on all cylinders. Whether you love the genre for the epic battles, the sense of deep history and gradually unveiling layers of lore, the rowdy fun that comes with traveling with a lovable group of goofball adventurers, or those serene moments where you're just taking it slow, enjoying the natural beauty of the Shire or Shire-like substitute landscape, this manga more than satisfies. At, again, two bucks a month, I 
honestly cannot recommend enough that you download the Viz app and dive right into this series at your earliest convenience. That said, I also said that this is gonna be Fall's best anime, and none of the praise that I've just levied at the manga necessarily guarantees that the adaptation will live up to it. So how can I be so confident in that assertion? Uh, well, for starters, the trailer packs a glorious one-two punch of sumptuous sakuga and a beautiful string-heavy score, but that's less than a minute of actual content. And while the studio behind that trailer, Madhouse, has a pretty darn strong track record, they're not exactly unimpeachable. There's every chance that the final product could fall short of that trailer or maybe deliver a banger first episode and then fall off is what I'd say if I didn't know who was working with Madhouse to bring the series to life. That score, for example, comes courtesy of Evan Call, composer for, among other things, Hakume and Mikochi, Apare Ranman, and Violet Evergarden. So the uplifting yet slightly haunting beauty of those strings definitely wasn't a fluke. And great orchestral music's like half the battle when it comes to filming fantasy, so that's a great start. Now, having a good script is another big part of it, but thankfully it's hard to think of better hands this adaptation could be in than those of Tomohiro Suzuki, who's previously written for Tiger and Bunny, Boogie Pop Phantom, Lupin the Third, Akka 13, and One Punch Man. Need I say more? Speaking of One Punch Man, producer Yuichiro Fukushi also coordinated animation production for that series, and many other consistently great-looking shows like Sunny Boy and Akka 13, so that gives me a lot of hope that the visual quality of that teaser will persist through the finished product. The manga's gorgeous artwork seems to be in equally good hands, with Reiko Nagasawa translating the character designs for animation. Most of her credits so far are for key animation or in-betweens, but she's previously worked on the very impressive monster designs of Overlord Season 3, and she also did both character designs and animation direction for Tact Ope Destiny, and I only need to show you, like, a couple seconds of that anime to fully justify my confidence in her work. Oh, and Fukushi was also the animation producer on that series, just by the by. Of course, the most important factor in determining the final anime's quality is almost certainly going to be the director, whose vision will unite and amplify all of those disparate talents. And to be fair, despite extensive experience as an animator, Keiichiro Saito does only have one other full series directing credit under his belt. But to be balanced, that series is Bochi the Rock, so... I just came a little. And I'm looking forward to making that a lot when the show finally comes out. Oh, God, what has anime done to my brain? You're welcome for that imagery, but you're even more welcome for introducing you to your new favorite fantasy manga and, very soon, anime. Just, you know, make sure you don't have too much planned around the time you start it, because this manga managed to tear my attention away from Tears of the Kingdom and kept me up to, like, 3 a.m. intermittently crying. It's real hard to put down. Anyway, that there's the video. Keep it tubular, my dudulars. Nope.